Welcome back. We will continue from uh, verse 3 of chapter 9. Okay, so uh, verse 3, my defense to those who examine me is this. Uh, so he is um, now responding to certain people who are questioning him. Uh, so what we talked about earlier was uh, the group of people who were siding with Apollos, uh, siding with other leaders, right? And the main reason was that Paul had chosen a life of manual labor. So he'd chosen to work to support himself in the ministry. Uh, and so he's responding to these people who are challenging his um, apostleship or his leadership within the church based on this choice that he's made to engage in manual labor. Uh, so he says in uh, verse 4, do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife as do the other apostles? Um, so he's he's talking about rights, right? So uh, what we saw in the previous chapter was he was saying, we know that all of these things are true, but if what we are doing is going to cause someone else to stumble, then we should refrain from it. Uh, in a similar way, he's saying, I have the right to uh, get, uh, to have food and to have something to drink. Uh, I have the right to take a wife, uh, just like the other apostles. Uh, the way he's saying it, although it is in a question form, almost to say, you give me the answers. Like, you know that what I'm saying is true, right? I have the right to eat and drink. So when he's saying, do we have no right to eat and drink, you say, uh, what would the answer be? It's a rhetorical question, right? Yes, you do have the right to eat and drink. Um, do we have no right to take along a believing wife as to the other apostles? And here he uh, gives a few examples of other apostles. And verse 6, is it only Barnabas and I who do not have the right to refrain from working? Uh, so here he's saying, I do have the right, like the other apostles, to have a wife who can come along with me and support me in the work that I'm doing. Uh, and Barnabas, both Barnabas and I, share this right. So Barnabas also, from this verse, uh, was someone who was unmarried and who was serving God. Uh, and he's saying, it's not that this right has been taken away just from Barnabas and me. We also have the right to, um, uh, to, uh, to work. Actually, he's talking about Barnabas working. So uh, is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? So uh, both Barnabas and him were working to support their ministries. Uh, but there were many other apostles who were being supported by churches, being supported by others uh, to do the work that they were doing. So they were not doing manual labor to uh, to support their work or to earn the finances or to get the uh, food and drink that he's referring to in verse 4, uh, to get all of that uh, work uh, that they were doing. So verse, six, uh, verse 7, sorry. Whoever goes to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit, or who tends a flock and does not drink. So all of these things are, yes, if you go to war, uh, someone is supporting you in that war. They are paying for you. You don't pay and then go and fight on behalf of a country. Uh, if you plant a vineyard, you will eat the fruit that comes from the vineyard. Uh, if you take care of sheep, you will drink uh, the milk that comes from those uh, from the flock that you are taking care of. Um, do I say these things as a mere man? So he's not, uh, now he goes back to scripture. He's saying, I'm not saying this merely from a human perspective. I'm going back to scripture itself, where God himself talks about uh, the fact that whoever works is worthy of pay. So when you work, you should be paid for your work. So verse 9, uh, 
you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain is it oxen god is concerned about so uh, here he is referring to uh, an old testament law uh, that uh, moses had uh, talked about so you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain uh, verse 10 or does he say it all together for our sakes for our sakes no doubt so he's not he's saying God didn't say that just for animals, right? That we only have to take care of the animals who help us out in the fields. No, he's giving us that as an example for us to learn about. And uh, the lesson that we can learn is that the people who work in the fields also should receive uh, their pay. And those who uh, help in the harvest should also receive their pay. So similarly, those who do ministry should be paid for the work that they are doing. Uh, verse 11, if we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing we reap your material things? So uh, elevating spiritual above the material. We are doing spiritual work among you. So taking something material from you is, uh, is definitely worth it. Uh, Verse 12, if others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not used this right, but endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. So there were other people who had received support from the Corinthian church, uh, whereas Paul and Barnabas themselves, who had been the ones who established the church, are not... Uh, are not receiving um, anything from the Corinthian church. So nevertheless, we have not used this right, but endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. So they have given up this right so that they will not hinder the gospel of Christ. Uh, how do you think the gospel of Christ would be hindered if they were using these rights? Yes, for uh, some people uh, would see that, okay, uh, we are supporting the work that is being done. Uh, and so uh, there would be a sense of, even a sense of uh, authority in a sense over them because you are able to do the work because we are supporting you. That would be one thing. And uh, that would put them in a place of, um, where they would not be as uh, receptive of what Paul was sharing because of that. Uh, another reason might be that people would question their motives for doing the work that they were doing. So they would uh, think that they are only doing the work for the sake of money, right? Just to receive money, uh, they were doing the work. So uh, they would question everything that they were doing. The, Whatever they were doing, they would question what is, the, uh, what is the motive behind it. Is it to try and get our money, to try and get more money from us, uh, all of these things. So to keep all of that from uh, being in the people's hearts when they were preaching the gospel, uh, they, they saw it best to just give them the gospel without giving them any burden of financial support so that they would know that we are coming with pure motives. Our goal is only to bring the gospel to you. And uh, you can see that we have nothing to take from you. There's nothing we are coming to receive from you. We are only coming to give. Um, and so they gave up their rights. So in all of these preceding verses, he's talking about these are all the rights we have. But we gave all these things up so that we could simply preach the gospel to you without any hindrance and you could receive it 
without having any kind of uh, questions or doubts in your mind. You could receive it uh, just as something we had come to give you. Uh, verse 13. Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple, and those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar? Uh, so he's going back to the Old Testament, uh, but also to um, even the pagan temples that were there, that the priests would uh, would be able to take the offerings that were being brought, the sacrifices that were being brought, uh, they would take a part of it for themselves. That was their pay, their way of sustaining themselves and their families. Uh, verse 14, even so the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. So not only in the Old Testament was this a practice, so he's in verse 13, he's talking about the Old Testament, where the Levites and the priests uh, would be able to share in the offerings that were coming into the temple. Uh, but even Jesus himself had uh, approved of those taking the gospel, receiving uh, payment for what they were doing or receiving support for what they were doing. So we see that uh, in Matthew 10, 10 and in Luke 10, 7, um if uh, would uh maybe two people or one person be able to read those two verses matthew 10 10 and luke 10 7. matthew 10 10. no bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff for the worker is worth his keep. 10.7. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Oh, uh, sorry, Luke 10, seven. Matthew 10.10, 10, you read that. So, uh, and then Luke 10.7. 10, seven. Luke 10.7. 10, seven. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. Okay. So here in both these places, we see where Jesus himself has said, uh, when you're going out for ministry, um, the people who are, you are ministering to should be uh, taking care of your physical needs, so your food and your stay and all of those things. Um, so Paul is, even though he's saying these are my rights, it's not these are my rights by my own thinking or by what the world has to say. These are my rights as per scripture, as per God's teaching himself. Um, and then in verse 15, he says, but I have used none of these things, nor have I written these things that it should be done so to me. For it would be better for me to die than that anyone should make my boasting void. So I, he's saying, I've given up all of these rights and I'm not writing now so that you will start to give me some wages. Uh, rather, uh, I would, I want to continue doing these things uh, because um, that's a reason for me to boast in the sacrifices that I've made uh, to bring the gospel to you. And he'll continue to talk more about this uh, from here. Um, <clears throat> so just some things that we talked about. So apart from Paul supporting what all he's sharing about eating foods offered to ideals, uh, we are also, there are some things we can learn about how we should be serving, right? So he's talking about apostleship. Um, one thing is he talks about the church themselves as evidence of his call, right? So the fruit of the work that has been done is evidence that uh, God himself had sent Paul and enabled him to do the work. Um, the second is that he had not abused his power in any way. Uh, instead, he'd gone on the other side of giving up his own rights for the sake of the work that he had to do. So giving up, uh, getting married, uh, giving up um, 
giving up uh, the right to receive payment, right? Uh, so he continued to work, even though that meant a lot of hard work for him, he continued to work to support the ministry that he was doing. Uh, so that is something that we can learn as well uh, when we are doing ministry, that uh, we look at the fruit of what we're doing. Uh, to show us, okay, is what we're doing really uh, bringing transformation? Is it really uh, fulfilling the ministry that God has entrusted to us? Are we seeing fruit in the work that we are doing? Uh, and the other is to be sacrificial, to give up uh, things that we may fully be able to claim as per our rights, but to give that up for the sake of the work uh, that needs to be done. Um, let's go on, uh, verses 16 to 18. We'll just maybe finish the chapter and then we can stop and ask questions if you've had any questions through uh, the last two chapters. So, verses 16 to 18. Anyone read that for us, please? For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boost of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yes, who to me if I do not preach the gospel? For if I do things willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have been entrusted with a stewardship, what is my reward then? What when I preach the gospel, I may present the gospel of Christ without charge, that I may not abuse my authority in the gospel. Amen. Yes, thank you. So he's saying, if I was simply preaching the gospel, uh, then I'm not doing anything great. I'm just doing what God has asked me to do. God has entrusted me with the task of taking the gospel to people, and I'm simply carrying out that task. Um, so I can choose to do it willingly or unwillingly. Um, if I'm doing it willingly, then I have a reward from God. Uh, that will come uh, when when uh, he finally judges me. If I do it against my will, what I'm simply doing is uh, acting as someone who has been given a task. I'm just simply doing it. I'm not going uh, doing it with the heart of uh, desiring to do what has been entrusted to me. I'm just doing it out of obedience. Um, so what so where is his real reward his reward is when he makes sacrifices from his own desire to make sacrifices god is not asking him to uh, give up receiving a payment or to give up the uh, support from the church in order to do his work right that is something that he has chosen to do and in that is his reward because what was the heart behind giving it up that there would be no hindrance to the gospel. So he's done it with that purpose, that people would just be able to receive the gospel without any obstacles, without any hindrance. Uh, and so in this is going to be his reward um, when Christ judges him. So uh, here we see that Paul talks about apostleship as stewardship. Uh, right, We are given a responsibility to carry out and we are accountable to God and to people to carry out that responsibility. Um, so we are simply stewards who are carrying out what God has entrusted to us. Uh, and that is another role of someone who is ministering or someone who is sent by God to be a steward of what God has entrusted to us. Um, go on from verses 19 to 23. Someone read that, please. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win them the more. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win Jews to those who are under the law and under the law that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, not being without law, 
toward God, but under under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became a weak, that I might win the weak. I became I have become all things in to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. Thank you. So uh, we saw in that first verse of chapter 9, he said, am I an apostle? Am I free? Right? Uh, so in these first few verses, he was talking about how he has uh, given up the rights of an apostle to do the work of uh, taking this gospel without hindrance. Now he's talking about how he's given up his rights as someone who is free uh, for the same reason, for the gospel's sake. Uh, so verse 19, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all. So he is someone who is not a slave. He was uh, free uh, in that he was not under anyone's authority. Uh, but he took the gospel to them freely. Uh, but at the same time, even though he was free, he chose to align himself with them so that they would be able to hear the gospel uh, in a way that made sense to them. So to the Jews, he took the gospel as a fulfillment of Jewish scripture to help them understand, uh, understand how Jesus fulfilled Jewish scripture. Uh, to those under the law, he still continued to respect the law, right? He didn't, uh, he didn't uh, kind of say, forget all of that, let's follow Jesus uh, now and not think about anything that the law talks about. Uh, verse 21, to those without the law, that is to the Gentiles, uh, he didn't force them to follow the law. Rather, he took what was important uh, and he only taught them what was important for them as those who were not under Jewish law. Um, and so he became like somebody who was uh, free from the law, even though he was a Jew. Uh, but at the same time, he was under the law of God. So there's freedom from the Jewish law, but still a submission to God's law, uh, God's rules of what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is evil. Um, and to the weak, I became weak, uh, that I might win the weak. So in each case, he, uh, and we can also take here to the weak, I became as weak as he, we don't know for sure, but in this case where he's talking to these elite people who don't want him to do uh, that work of tent making, to the weak, I became weak, right? He became like the, uh, the lower class in that Corinthian society to win those people. So in each case, he identified himself with the people that he was taking the gospel to so that uh, so that they would be able to share in uh, salvation in Jesus. So verse 23, now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. So I do this uh, so that you may hear the gospel and so that we may both share in the benefits of believing in Christ, uh, so that uh, I may share it with you, right? Uh, and so that is the challenge for us, as we are people who are sent out by God. Uh, are we willing to uh, go to where they are, to identify with them to the extent that uh, we make sacrifices on our things that we would prefer? Uh, I'm sure uh, Paul would have preferred to um, not be working day and night, maybe to be able to get some rest. But he chose to do that extra work so that he could reach uh, a certain group of people. Uh, to the Gentiles, even though he was someone who had been raised in Jewish law and steeped in that kind of thinking, he had to uh, unlearn so much of what he had learned uh, to be able to reach this other group of Gentiles. So, and he was also then, um, there were Jews who came against him because of that, right? So there was so much opposition to his work because uh, people felt that he had given up uh, Jewish teaching. 
so the Jews felt insulted by what he was doing. So he made huge sacrifices, and we might be called to make big sacrifices like that, to move to places that may not be the most comfortable, uh, to minister to people who might be outside of uh, what is acceptable in society, or uh, people who are accepted in society, uh, to reach out to those kinds of people. And that would require sacrifice on our part. Uh, so for us to be um, with that mindset and that willingness to make those sacrifices for the sake of the gospel so that others can benefit from the gospel like we have benefited as well. Um, should we stop here for questions? Do you want to continue or do you want to address some questions and then we continue? Do you have any questions? Maybe you can bring it up now so that. Uh, yeah, so um, we can do things um, unwillingly, but just because we feel this is the right thing to do or we want to be obedient. So it's a mindset of a, a servant or a slave. Right? You may not have the heart to do it. You are just doing it because uh, this is what has been told to me. And this is why uh, we see... Uh, so many times this question of what is the motivation behind what we are doing is it really uh, god's heart for the people is it uh, really god's heart for us also that is motivating us or is it just okay i'll do this because so even in this we are being faithful to carry out this task right so he's saying i've been entrusted with this and i'm doing it uh, but my reward is when I actually do it with that willingness, with that uh, a pure motivation that comes from God, with that heart of God for the people uh, and to take the gospel to people. So I can still do it without that. Uh, and I would be doing the work that God has entrusted me. I'll be faithful in that. Uh, but I would not get the reward of someone who is doing it uh, with a willingness. More thoughts, no questions. I just want to say scripture that takes that you gave me the sample of the sacrifice. Yeah, I think it is a good person. And then this half of scripture that comes in for the first one. Which one is that, sorry? The category is a good person. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Just the whatever category is in the reference. Okay. Um, so those are, um, I'll read them out. They're in the notes also. Uh, Revelation 21, 14 is for the 12 apostles. And the criteria for those 12 apostles is in Acts 1, 21 to 22. Then the founding apostles is Ephesians 2, 20, Ephesians 3, 1 to 5. And then uh, the uh, like for those who are continuing that ministry in the current day church is Ephesians 4, 11 to 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, 28. 12, 28.
Any other questions? Does uh, anyone have questions or anything you want to share from what we've done so far? Okay, we will uh, continue to the end of this chapter then. Mm. So verses 24 to 27, someone willing to read that? Do you not know that those who run in all race all run but one receive the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who completes for the price is temper temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an unperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus not with uncertainty, thus I fight not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjugation, least when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Thank you. So, uh, Paul is talking to the Corinthians who are very familiar with, uh, with the Olympics, right? And uh, with all of the sportsmanship. So he's using this example from their culture. Um, so in Corinth itself, uh, there was uh, games that were hosted every two years and they were almost like the Olympics. They were as big, uh, they were second only to the Olympics. So they saw a lot of these uh, things happening in, around, in and around them, these athletics happening around them. So he's saying, you know the kind of discipline and the self-sacrifice that is involved by these athletes. Uh, there is uh, intense training for long periods of time before they can even participate in the race, right? So they have to go through this uh, kind of training to prepare themselves. Uh, and then when they run the race, uh, they are ready to run and to endure whatever is required for them to win. Um, and so even though so many people go through all of this training, only one of them actually receives the prize at the end of it. Uh, they all have gone through the training. They've all been prepared and they've gone through like intense preparation for it. Uh, but at the end, out of all of them, only one person receives a prize. So you be like that one person. Uh, to go the extra mile, to uh, to prepare even more, and then when you actually run the race, to give it your all, uh, so that you win the prize. Uh, so everyone who competes in these games runs only for things that are temporary. Uh, so the what they would receive was the crown with the leaves in it that decayed almost uh, within a few days, right? So they did such, uh, they committed themselves so much to this, they sacrificed so much for it just to get that crown. But you are doing it for a crown that is eternal. Uh, so uh, when you run, don't run without a specific uh, uh, sense of purpose in what you are doing. Run as someone who has purpose, right? and prepare as someone with a purpose, a purpose to win. Uh, so he says in verse 26, I run thus not with uncertainty, and I fight thus not as one who beats the air. So I'm not doing it without purpose. I am preparing very specifically for uh, what is to come. So I'm not going to just uh, practice uh, by beating the air. I'm going to do the work that is involved uh, to be prepared to fight somebody, fight a physical person. Um, I discipline my body, I bring it into subjection uh, so that when I have finished preaching and sharing the gospel with everyone else, I myself am not disqualified from the race. Right? So, uh, so I'm doing all of these things for so that I can make sure that I uh, at the end of the day, can stand before God. 
uh, with boldness and know that, okay, I've done everything. I've sacrificed, I've made, um, I've, uh, I've loved people, I've done things beyond what was asked of me uh, because I uh, wanted to have a pure heart and I wanted to know that I could be, uh, that I would stand before you with a blameless heart. Uh, so he's saying, do the physical kind of things, discipline your body, do all of those things that are required so that you can have the spiritual fruit of it, that you can stand before God uh, with that kind of confidence. So uh, the key lessons uh, regarding service or being called into ministry that we can take away from this chapter is that uh, when we serve people, we want to see that there is transformation of lives, and that is through the gospel. We want to see that kind of transformation. Uh, serving God requires sacrifice. Uh, serving God is stewardship, so there is responsibility and accountability. We are entrusted with the responsibility, and then we are accountable to God and to people. Uh, serving God is uh, serving people by willingly entering their world, right? So identifying with them and being able to serve them where they are. And then serving God requires self-governing ability. So what we did in this last section of uh, disciplining oneself and making the sacrifices necessary uh, to uh, prove ourselves faithful at the end of our own lives. Okay, so um, some of the main things that we can take away from this with regard to what Paul has been sharing uh, in the with regard to uh, eating food sacrificed to idols, what do you what do you all see as some key takeaways from this passage? How does this relate to that uh, food sacrificed to idols? and what he talked about in chapter eight. So uh, one thing is the giving up of rights, right? So he said, I'm my apostle. These are all my rights as an apostle, but I've given them all up uh, so that you may be able to receive the gospel without any hindrance or the gospel may come to you without any hindrance. Uh, so one is giving up of rights. Um, the other is giving up of freedom, right? So uh, am I free? Yes, and then he says, um, I became a Jew to Jews, I became a... So uh, even though he was a free person, he gave up his freedom uh, so that the gospel uh, would be able to make its way to them. And uh, he would be able to uh, share the blessings of the gospel with them. They both would be able to share in those blessings. Um, and uh, so we see those two things of uh, giving up his rights, giving up his freedom so that the gospel uh, would be received and so that they would be all, all be able to share in the benefits of the gospel. Uh, and so that is something that he's going to then continue into in chapter nine, uh, talking about, okay, what does that mean uh, in chapter 10, sorry. Uh, what else can we look at in Old Testament history uh, that we can learn from? Okay, uh, so he looks at the Hebrews uh, when they come out of Egypt and they are in the wilderness. What are some mistakes that they made? How can we learn from their mistakes? Um, and how can we have the right heart attitude? To live this out. Um, now we we'll just uh, look a little bit at the background as well of what at what time this was when Paul uh, was 
talking to the Corinthians about all of this. So, um, so in about 49 AD, that is between Paul's first and second missionary journeys, is where Acts 15 uh, talks about Paul and Barnabas going to Jerusalem to talk to them about, uh, ask them this question of can Gentiles eat food sacrificed to idols? Uh, and so Acts 15, uh, the apostles send them back with certain instructions for the Gentiles. Someone can read Acts 15, 28 to 29. Acts 15, 28 and 29. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Thank you. So... Here, uh, this was a teaching that the council had, that, that was a conclusion that they came to, that uh, the Gentiles do not need to follow the Jewish laws. Uh, they don't need to be circumcised. Uh, the only things that they need to follow is to abstain from uh, things that are offered to idols, from blood um, that is in the, in the meat, uh, from anything that is strangled, from sexual immorality. So we see that uh, Paul then returns back with this teaching to the Gentiles. And after this, he goes on his second missionary journey. And it is during his second missionary journey that he goes to Corinth and establishes the church there. So um, no doubt that as he was establishing the church, he also was teaching these things to the Gentiles. Uh, but somehow it's uh, maybe they had not fully understood the teaching or they had forgotten the teaching. Uh, Paul now here has to continue to explain further to them what uh, had already been shared previously when he established the church. So as he writes this letter, he's uh, building upon what he's already shared with them. Uh, so this chapter, we'll see the first 14 verses are lessons from Israel's history. Uh, then there's a small section which talks about uh, the cup and the bread. Um, then there's idols and sacrifices, you know, of six verses on that, and then food offered to idols. Uh, so he goes back and he closes this section uh, with this topic of food offered to idols. So... Um, Let's look at verses 1 to 4, if someone can read verse 1 to 4. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. Uh, Sir, I think, uh, are you in the right book? First Corinthians chapter I'm so 10. Sorry. Um, first, I'm sorry, I'm at yeah. No problem. First Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. Yes. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Thank you. So um, here, uh, so Paul has talked about his own life. Now he's going into Israel's history and saying what can be learned from Israel's history. Uh, so... All of, all of their ancestors had together seen the cloud of uh, God's presence, right? That was leading them uh, from Egypt into the promised land. 
So day and night, that cloud was before them, and they were following the cloud uh, to go to the promised land. So everyone who left from Egypt, all of them saw the same cloud. All of them passed through the Red Sea. All of them experienced these miracles, uh, this divine leading um, and revelation of God's power. Uh, all of them, uh, so verse 2, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Uh, so he's using that word baptism to kind of connect it to the early church of being baptized in the water. Uh, he's saying like you were baptized in the water and have now become part of the church. These people went through these experiences and um and became part of the chosen people of god who were led out of egypt um and then verse three all ate the same spiritual food so all of them had the same spiritual experiences and all uh took part or uh, were fed the same spiritual food the same spiritual drink uh so although that was a physical food right they received manna and they received uh, water that was physical food, but there was a divine uh, provision that all of them could see. Them, how the manna came to them, how they received water every time there was no water in the wilderness. How God provided water to them. Uh, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Uh, so we read about the rock uh, from which water uh, gushed forth. Right? When, there, when there was no water in the wilderness and the Israelites uh, were, were grumbling or were uh, needy, in need of water, God provided water from the rock. So um, that is not to say that Jesus was the rock that was there with them in the wilderness, but to point to the fact that that rock, that provision uh, that came from the rock, is a pointer to Jesus and how Jesus uh, provides that same spiritual uh, food that we need and provides that spiritual drink uh, where we go on to see in this chapter how that how he explains that. Uh, but like that rock provided it to them when they were in the wilderness, Jesus now provides it to the church. And um, so this is the use of uh, what we look at types in the Old Testament, where a type uh, points to Jesus in the New Testament, and Jesus the fulfillment of what was uh, shown in the Old Testament. Uh, and then verse 5, with most of them, God was not pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. So, the, so uh, Paul is saying, all of them went through these spiritual experiences. They all saw the power of God. They were all uh, part of God's chosen people. They were all baptized. They were all uh, brought into that uh, brought into that body that God had created of His chosen people. Uh, but still, some of them didn't reach the promised land that God had uh, given to them, right? Because of the things they did which is what he will uh, talk about in verse 6 onward. Uh, so this is his warning to them. He's saying, don't think that uh, just because you are in the church now, uh, you can be confident in the fact that you are going to, uh, going to reach that promised land of God's presence, eternal presence, uh, eternal presence. Um, uh, being eternally with God, right? So just like these people have experienced all of these powerful things, they fell away from God. And so he's warning them to not lose their way, uh, but to stay on track with God. And we'll go on into what all what are the things that he uses as examples next week. Uh, but that is his, uh, like what he was saying before this, of running the race to win the prize. Right? So to uh, run in such a way that you know you will reach the end, and you will not only reach the end, but you will receive the prize that you are running for. Uh, so that thought is uh, continued here in these first five verses. Okay, so we'll close with that for now, and then we'll continue next week. Thank you all for being here.
the best.